Happy Friday to everyone. Hopefully we've got some good work plans, lunch break plans, or weekend plans. Uh, it's quite a topic. Uh, most people initially like to think about ventilator graphics in some form or fashion uh, because it's a necessary part of the daily routine if you work in ICU. Uh, with that said, I'll go to the uh, learning objectives and we will we'll start the uh, session here. Okay, so basically the endpoints of today's talk, the purpose thereof to recognize ventilator graphics and really try to pick up on some of the nuances that make it represent what it does. In other words, what is really being manifested at face value, pun intended, on the graphical user interface. We wanna to try to identify ways to make it better. A patient should never be placed on mechanical ventilation and it suddenly become more difficult to breathe. We want work of breathing to diminish, not to increase. And evaluating ventilator scalars allows us to center in on that overall overarching goal. We wanna to try to explain what caused it to begin with and maybe backtrack, work our way in reverse to figure out the best solution. And I think all the patient care advocates on the call could agree there's someone's loved one, there's someone's family member attached to that machine. And really the most important part of patient care, it's not complex, it's patient care, right? It's a tough crowd out there. Uh, we're going to get started. So here we are. This is now standard part of most any mechanical ventilation that you're going to employ. It is the graphical user interface. Now, just a decade and a half ago, and certainly farther back, graphics were only an option through special order, through special request, or if you had the latest technology available at your hospital. I distinctly remember having to send someone to find the one that had the graphics package or to call the rep to come in to bring us the attachment, which would give us the visuals. Um, any seasoned therapist on the call today can vouch for the fact that graphics, scalars, so-called graphical user interfaces with touchscreen and real-time visual alerts have only come into the picture, pun intended, over the last 20 years or so. Now, ventilator graphics and scalars are now something that all respiratory therapists, all clinicians, ordering providers, uh, even nurses, they should be well-versed in, but particularly RTs. You are the experts in mechanical ventilation, and I know I'm preaching to the choir. Now, not only recognizing an issue, but being able to troubleshoot and resolve the problem is paramount, and usually to resolve it quickly. That's the key, right? So I just wanna put a disclaimer here. I mean, sometimes you recognize the issue, you understand the cause, but you do not have an ability to resolve that issue, and that's understandable. That's where collaboration, interprofessional uh, collaboration, that's where the ordering provider has the ultimate onus, that responsibility. But just a clinical nugget that I know those of you who work with neurologically impaired or compromised patients will appreciate. For those with neurologic compromise, it's very difficult in some of those patients in that category to synchronize with mechanical ventilation. Patients who are under sedated or those with poor pain control or those with unusually high anxiety can also be difficult to synchronize up with positive pressure ventilation. Now, although positive pressure ventilation is quite complex, the premise of breath delivery is quite simple. The ventilator is a pressurized flow generator delivering volume over time, which by definition, that's flow, by the way. Mathematically, that's flow, which in turn results in pressure being applied to a relatively expandable yet delicate lung unit or units thereof known as the alveoli. So positive pressure ventilation is always antiphysiologic. It's never a normal part of physiology to create positive pressure during inspiration. The only time under normal circumstances during spontaneous breathing in which positive pressure should exist in the alveoli is that split second when we transition from inspiration to expiration, when you get that passive elastic recoil of the lung tissue transitioning from I to E. In other words, only at the onset of expiration would we normally experience positive intraalveolar pressure. However, 
we now place somebody on a machine and it becomes like blowing up a balloon. Unfortunately, these balloons are quite thin and delicate. They're joined together end on end, side by side. They're separated by septal walls. They share collateral pathways known as pores of cone, canals of Lambert. And if you're a super nerd out there, I've got my lifetime membership card, fenestrations of Boron. So that said, although lung tissue, the alveoli specifically, is not an exact replica of a balloon, let's make that clear, its quality of expansion and contraction is not terribly different. You must think about inflation and deflation of the lung in general, like blowing up a balloon. Now look, we're going to get to ventilator graphics. Just relax. I'm going to give you more than you probably ever wanted to see on a Friday at lunchtime or afternoon. We'll get to it. But in general, it is like blowing up a balloon. The ventilator is a flow generator. The balloon is the lung tissue as a whole. As flow enters a sealed system like a balloon, the lung, it resists expansion so that as flow enters the balloon, it begins to expand, but it's resisting stretch and therefore pressure builds. So the initial burst of flow during mechanical ventilation, when that valve opens and the trigger whether time or patient causes flow to be injected into the airways first. This burst of flow then primes the system. It overall begins to pressurize the system. Flow creates pressure resulting at the end of inspiration in the accumulation of volume. So to summarize, the ventilator is a flow delivery system that creates pressure within the respiratory system that causes volume to accumulate as a product of flow entering into that sealed system. You know, it's not dissimilar to pouring a glass of water into a balloon as shown here. Think simply as we move on to more complex topics. There's a reminder here when, when talking about PEEP, positive end expiratory pressure. Laplace's law shows that the distending pressure of a liquid sphere is directly proportional to the surface tension of the liquid and inversely proportional to the radius of that sphere. So in other words, as the surrounding tension of a liquid bubble increases, in other words, expanding alveoli, the distending pressure necessary to hold the bubble open also increases. And when the size of a liquid bubble increases, the distending pressure necessary to hold the bubble open decreases. So under normal circumstances, at the end of expiration, alveoli do not completely collapse and they remain partially inflated. You and I know this very well. This is not due to positive pressure, what is known as intrinsic PEEP. There is no such thing as intrinsic PEEP. There is no positive pressure in the lung tissue at the end of expiration. What holds the lung tissue passively open is the tethering oppositional forces between the tendency of the lung tissue towards collapse and the tendency of the chest wall towards expansion. So it's not positive pressure, but because of the oppositional forces of the lungs versus the chest wall. This opposing tethering between lung tissue and chest wall create the negative intrapleural space and allow alveoli to remain partially inflated at rest or at end expiration. Now this is under normal circumstances. Remember, if the chest wall is not breached, our lungs persist in a vacuum. Now that's under spontaneous breathing conditions. Let's talk about mechanical ventilation. Now look, not to inundate today's topic with unnecessary items, but we have to keep in mind the way that gas is delivered during positive pressure ventilation. Newton's equation of motion states that acceleration is the derivative of the velocity and that velocity is the derivative of position. In positive pressure ventilation, you and I as therapists, we have to overcome the elastic and resistive forces of the lung through mechanical ventilation. The elastic recoil force of the lung increases as volume increases. In other words, the more uh, stretch of an entity like the lung, like a rubber band, um, to a certain degree, the more elastic recoil force is created. So here's a slight variation to Newton's equation of motion, more in alignment with concepts of mechanical ventilation. Now, delta P is a very important concept. Delta P, also known as driving pressure, 
and you that were on the call a little earlier, there's one in the um, archives for uh, respiratory associates dealing with driving pressure. Feel free to visit that. Uh, well, driving pressure is determined by the products of airways resistance and flow as well as the compliance compared to volume, the lung compliance compared to volume. In other words, the type and certainly size of the artificial airway in conjunction with the size and qualities of the conducting airways definitely influence what pressure is necessary to expand the alveoli. Now, this is all while having to consider the distensibility of the lung tissue, essentially the quality of the alveoli. And many of our patients are lying down, some with their chest walls wrapped, whether bandaged, fresh surgical dressing, or the so-called turtle shell. These are just examples. You've got a rigid or inexpandable chest wall that can be just as hampering to lung expansion as stiff, non-compliant lungs. These are things you've got to keep front of mind as a respiratory care practitioner. I mean, we are out there on the front lines every day dealing with a machine hooked up to a very delicate structure, and we're asked to make real-time changes under very uh, tight time constraints, it can be a daunting task, but certainly you're on the call because you care enough to revisit the topic of ventilator scalars, and we're about to get into some coming up. We're laying some groundwork. So this very simple schematic represents where flow pressure and volume is measured during positive pressure ventilation. The machine only reads what is going out and what is coming in. Now, yeah, your, your, your humidifier can monitor you know, a temperature at the Y and at the heater and, and different stages through the circuit, but the machine only reads what is going out and coming in. Yes, there can be additional sensors through that closed loop system, but this closed loop system is a pressurized conduit in which patients are delivered flow under very high velocity conditions, mind you, and where valves are opened and closed to create pressure and maintain pressure. So that graphical user interface that's giving you that visual of all of the scalars and tracings that we love to maybe overanalyze at times, all the ventilator is doing is telling a story of what is really happening within the patient's lung tissue. I love this quote. It's an interesting quote by a Swiss American photographer, and he was a documentary filmmaker. Um, sort of makes your brain itch, but what we're promoting here today is just how much a graphical user interface on the ventilator can tell us about the internal environment of the patient. So I propose a slight addition to this world famous quote. Yes, a picture is worth a thousand words, but as a respiratory therapist in the ICU at bedside evaluating positive pressure ventilation, our pictures are constantly moving and changing. Sometimes you have to, you know, you have the luxury of being able to see a repeated pattern. Other times it's a one-time alert of an isolated event and you have to capture it quickly. Uh, you may not be able to appreciate it in full and it may lead to a worsening of overall condition or a synchrony if you don't pick up on it as it's flashing across the screen. And you say, well, I can't be at bedside 24 seven. I guess you could, uh, you may not be awake, uh, you may be asleep, but uh, you know, all, all joking aside, it's a lot of responsibility. So if you're not familiar with Robert Chatburn's work, he's one of the most prolific ventilator experts and respiratory therapist researchers of our day. Um, currently, he's the clinical research manager of respiratory care at the Cleveland Clinic. Now, arguably, there are almost 500 different names for ventilator modes in the market today. That's, that's staggering. But the main target or control variable should always be known and considered, whether it's volume that we're targeting and controlling or pressure that we're targeting or controlling, or you and I both know that we have hybrids of each of these now. So typically, the mode of positive pressure ventilation is clearly delineated on the screen. We can walk up, we can see what mode they're in, we can read it out. It's part of the electronic health records auto population process. But the means in which the breath is delivered is not always clear to every clinician managing the ventilator. A true appreciation of patient ventilator interaction status is definitely an art. And certainly it takes a bit of practice to master. Even the most seasoned expert in respiratory care occasionally is puzzled by what manifests on the ventilator scalars, right? I mean, one of our goals today is to reinvigorate the confidence and increase your appreciation for certain more common scenario. And look, I'm not signing off until we do that today. So I'm just warning you, 
we do have some very graphic images coming up. And I do say that tongue in cheek. So let's look at some examples moving forward. To start, it is so vital to understand that flow delivery is the primary factor that influences breath delivery overall during mechanical ventilation. Your flow waveform typically tells the majority of the story. So if you're following along here on the screen and not just on your lunch break, uh, surfing the web, <laughs> you've got flow scalars here at the bottom. We're going to uh, divide these up here in just a moment. But for this slide, let's focus initially on the flow scalar for each of the five separate breaths as shown on the screen. And I've added in dividers so you can focus on one breath at a time. Now, it's worth noting that for all waveforms shown, tidal volume is the same. You see here, it's approximately the same across the board, even though we're representing, if you follow the cursor here, we're representing the uh, four, three, four, five different breaths. So this is all one breath, first column. Of course, each column is its own individual breath. Notice that tidal volume is relatively identical across the board, about 650 mils, give or take. Now, compliance is also the same among the breaths, so we're not saying one lung is stiffer than the other, less compliant, they're all the same, and we're saying that flow resistance is the same among these five breaths shown, so let's keep that in mind. Now, we're looking at uh, figure A here to the far left represents traditional pressure-controlled inspiration with what's called an exponential decay flow waveform. It's also known as a decelerating flow delivery pattern. Um, now peak flow or the highest flow speed is at the onset of inspiration with a pressure mode with the flow rapidly slowing until it reaches zero at the cycle. Remember that as flow is injected into the airway, it's maxed. It's the highest velocity it's going to be. If you follow the cursor here, it rapidly decelerates. It slows until finally we reach right at zero, and that's where the breath cycles from I to E. It is very easy to pick up on a flow scalar. It is the only one that traditionally goes below the baseline here. Even if these were not labeled by flow volume pressure or liters per minute, liters and centimeters of water, you could tell it a mile away. The next breath over, breath B here, next column, represents traditional volume controlled inspiration with a rectangular flow pattern. This is also known as a constant flow delivery. So here flow is the same at the onset, the flow speed at the onset of inspiration as it is at the end of inspiration. In other words, flow out of the gate reaches its peak and it's held there for the entire inspiratory time until a cycle occurs and we go from inspiration to expiration. So already there is a dramatic difference between the means in which flow is delivered between breath A and breath B. If you turn your attention to the rest of the scalars shown for breath A and B, you can see pressure is held constant for breath A, but it is progressively increasing until it reaches its peak at the end of inspiration for breath B. In other words, the more gentle flow delivery pattern is going to be decelerating versus the flow pattern in which flow is the same at onset as it is at the end of inspiration. Now moving to the middle column here, breath C, you've got an accelerated flow pattern. This is not that common. It's called an ascending ramp in which flow speed increases to peak flow at the end of inspiration. Uh, the column D here represents a similar flow pattern to breath A where we have decelerating here. It's called exponential decay. This one is a little bit more linear in its downward uh, de or its decrease in peak flow. So we've got peak flow as it's defined here at the onset and near the end of the breath, it's its lowest velocity. Now, if you consider that breath A and D flow patterns are the more gentle of delivery modalities for flow, we still have that initial burst of flow that primes the system in the larger conducting airways. And as flow reaches those distal smaller airways down to the alveoli, 
flow velocity has significantly slowed. And what this does, it promotes a more laminar flow pattern overall as that bolus reaches the most delicate lung regions. In other words, and we'll move on after this, but you've got the flow that is its highest flow speed at onset of inspiration. It rapidly decelerates until we get to a very slow flow here. It just happens to coincide with the point at which majority of the initial burst is reaching the more delicate lung units. Again, with breath D here, you can see very similar. So for the last breath to the right, the far right here on E, uh, for this breath, you're seeing the so-called sinusoidal waveform. It's most similar to our normal physiologic breathing pattern. Now there's nothing physiologically normal about positive pressure ventilation, but the sinusoidal means of flow delivery is about as close as you can get to our normal situation. Flow progressively accelerates to a peak flow rate, but immediately begins to slow back to zero at the transition from inspiration to expiration. In other words, the cycle is still here where flow decreases back down to zero, but we have a progressive increase as well as a progressive decrease. Now, if you're talking about uh, CPAP or true spontaneous breathing during traditional invasive positive pressure ventilation, breath E is about as close as it gets. Now, before we move away from this slide, turn your attention to the top row of each breath, the pressure scalar, just all the way across here. And what you'll notice, uh, the short dotted lines represent mean inspiratory pressure, also known as mean airway, while the, uh, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> mean inspiratory pressure, while the dotted lines the longer ones represent mean airway pressure. And we're assuming zero peep for all of these because we can see that pressure reaches back down to zero. So note that for the rectangular pressure waveform in A, the mean airway pressure is the same as the mean inspiratory pressure. So there's more consistency. In other words, if you're in a true pressure targeting, pressure controlled mode, your peak pressure usually is very close, if not equal, to your plateau pressure. Just a nugget to keep in mind. Now, this simple one breath rendition of the three main variables of mechanical ventilation represents a volume targeting mode of delivery. Now, let me be clear here. We have multiple ventilators on the market today in the last five years where the software availability has allowed us to actually manually change flow pattern from square to decelerating, from decelerating to square. I understand that's a possibility, but we're talking more traditional to start here. So let's begin with the most important sensitive indicator of issues, the flow scalar. You can see it here in the middle. So note that flow is constant from the onset of inspiration here until the end of inspiration, the flow rate is the same. Because of this, volume is progressively building if you follow the cursor here on the volume scalar until there's a transition at C here from inspiration to expiration. Now also note just how much pressure builds as long as flow is rushing in at peak levels. Pressure is increasing to PIP. So you've got flow from peak here that's continuing on from peak and maintaining its velocity. Pressure is rapidly rising. Very important. With a flow pattern such as shown here, your conducting airways and your distal lung has to adapt to this rapid influx of flow, which causes pressure to quickly accumulate. That's why in a, a true pressure mode, flow has to slow down rapidly, otherwise pressure would continue to build. But the opposite is true for a volume mode, as you're seeing here. The goal, you're simply telling the ventilator, when you set a volume mode of ventilation with a controlled or set flow uh, rate, you're telling the ventilator, I'm giving you this amount of flow in this amount of time to accomplish this amount of volume. It's at the expense of pressure. The ventilator doesn't control pressure beyond the upper pressure limit or the force cycle. So it's just some things to be reminded of, if anything. Let's take a look at a volume targeting mode graphic with prolonged inspiratory time. Now take note of what occurs during the prolonged eye time. This is called a integrated very short breath hold. You've got during this pause phase is labeled here. Now this is a volume mode. You go from peak to plateau pressure. You super clinicians on the call certainly know how to acquire a true static compliance measurement. You've got to acquire plateau pressure during a inspiratory breath hold. 
Now, not all patients tolerate an integrated breath hold, particularly those with consistent spontaneous efforts. However, a prolonged inspiratory time will immediately increase your mean airway pressure and this breath hold integrated, if they can tolerate it as a patient, it often enhances lung recruitment and oxygenation. If you recall back from RT school, way back when the surface area under this scalar that happens to be uh, colored in sort of khaki off white, if you will, this area underneath the pressure scalar represents mean airway pressure. The more surface area you can create under that pressure scalar, the more mean airway pressure you're administering. And mean airway means average pressure applied to the airway. And it can be very helpful in patients with oxygenation deficit, those with refractory hypoxemia or the like. Now on the left, you have a traditional volume targeted mode of delivery. On the right, you have a traditional pressure targeted mode of delivery. However, again, in the current market, there are several ventilators that allow the clinician to manipulate flow delivery irrespective of whether volume targeting or pressure targeting. Just recall that uh, the left-sided example of constant flow delivery will allow more control over the tidal volume because the flow rate and the velocity, as it's known, is the same at onset of the trigger here as it is throughout the breath delivery. It only reaches zero during the breath hold in this scenario. For the right-sided example of decelerating flow rate, it's more of a gentle means of delivering flow. Even though peak flow is higher for this breath than this one here, it rapidly slows down almost immediately. So it's the, the flow velocity is highest at onset of inspiration and slow da slows down to nothing near the end of inspiration here. Notice on both of these scalars, a small breath hold is represented. Now, integrated breath holds are typically not well tolerated by patients that are awake and alert, but they can be useful in increasing mean airway pressure and for lung recruitment. That's one of the things you can do without dramatically altering your mode of ventilation, without having to you know, prone a patient, some of the others that we may consider for refractory hypoxemia. Now, their cardiovascular status has to be considered. If they're dry, they've got intravascular volume depletion, they probably need a fluid bolus before you try to significantly increase mean airway. Now, this is the same example we just viewed on the prior slide, but now you're seeing all the main entities of the components of breath delivery shown. So on the left-hand side, you have a traditional volume targeted delivery mode, and on the right, you have a traditional pressure targeted delivery mode. How do I know this? Well, I've got a consistent flow, square flow pattern here, which represents a volume mode, and I've got a decelerating or an exponential decay or slowing flow pattern, which represents pressure. Now, note what is additionally interesting here with both breaths represented is during the breath hold for the constant flow velocity breath, the lung pressure settles a bit. If you see it here, during the breath hold, it goes from whatever pressure it was prior, and there's a settling of pressure. For the constant flow breath, you can see even during the breath hold, there's really not much change in pressure. So for the decelerating flow velocity breath, lung pressure remains constant even during the breath hold. Worth noting also is that tidal volume is identical for each breath here at the top. You will see a slightly higher pressure, a PIP, with constant flow delivery pattern here. The PIP is high versus your typical pressure mode, where PIP is really controlled. That's pressure control at its best. I love this. Surely we've all been here, right? We've all experienced it. Look, some of my best friends are nurses. I have to give them a hard time. So this is a great reference picture directly from one of our ventilator user manuals. And look, I understand it sounds super nerdy to do this, but all therapists, in my opinion, should know what ventilator they use at their hospital and download the user's manual via PDF on your phone, on your work computer. Surely the entity you work for will allow a download of the user's manual on the computer. And you need to visit it often, especially if a conundrum arises or you have uh, a newer physician. We're in an academic medical center here. We have new residents. Uh, it's just a good refresher. It's go this picture, uh, let me just get to the point. It's going to help lay a bit of groundwork uh, before we proceed into troubleshooting scenarios upcoming. And I'm hoping to give you some very common troubleshooting scenario you can put into practice even today if you're working or later today when you go in or next week when you come back.
So let me just give you what everything is labeled here. And you can revisit the video that uh, Mr. Barnes is going to post later. X represents inspiratory time. Y represents pause time. There's a breath hold integrated here. The number one, you can see labeled here, represents the start of inspiration, also known as the trigger. Number two represents peak inspiratory pressure. Number three is that early inspiratory pause pressure. Number four is just the end inspiratory pause pressure. Number five is early uh, expiratory pressure. And number six is end expiratory pressure, affectionately known as PEEP. Number seven, this is peak flow, peak inspiratory flow. Number eight is the zero flow phase when you're doing the breath hold. Number nine represents peak expiratory flow. Is that important? It can be in certain situations. Uh, number 10 is just showing you the slope of the decelerating expiratory limb. Number 11 is end expiratory flow. Number 12, moving on to my volume scalar here. Number 12 is the start of inspiration, also known as the trigger point. Number 13 is the slope, uh, represents current delivery of inspiratory tidal volume. And then number 14 represents end inspiration, active phase only, because there's a breath hold. And then number 15 is just the slope uh, that represents current patient delivery of expiratory tidal volume. And of course, 16 is PEEP, end expiratory uh, volume in this place, uh, in this case, rather, not PEEP, because we're not on a pressure scalar, but you're at PEEP. It's just showing end expiratory volume, which really should be zero. Now, expiratory volume should be very closely matching with inspiratory but there should not be residual. So just a clean example of two breaths shown in succession. Um, each breath has the pressure, the flow, and the volume scalar represented. Pressure at the top, flow in the middle, volume at the bottom. Worth noting, during mechanical ventilation, from trigger to cycle is considered inspiratory time. So this X here, from the onset to the cycle, from the trigger to the change from I to E, this entire area here on each scalar represents inspiratory time. On mechanical ventilation, it's quite interesting. You and I, of course, we breathe one part's in, one part's out. You do not breathe out longer than you breathe in necessarily, unless you have obstruction and then you need a PFT. <laughs> but if you are talking about mechanical ventilation, from cycle until the next trigger is all considered expiratory time, even if there is a pause where no flow is moving. In other words, we're on transition at the cycle from I to E, starting here on each scalar, until the very next trigger, even though my breath technically ended here, on mechanical ventilation, expiratory time is counted uh, for the entire time between cycle and trigger. Now my cursor's moving. So although we breathe in and out essentially the same amount of time, on mechanical ventilation, it's widely accepted that normal I to E ratio is one to two because the pause between reaching FRC and the next trigger is all counted as part of expiration. So just a quick brain break. What you're seeing here, as you trauma therapists well know, is actually called the seatbelt sign. And when a patient presents after a motor vehicle collision with this, atop possibly pulmonary contusions, you should suspect potential abdominal, maybe specific liver injury. Also, once thoracic trauma is ruled out, um, you, you need to consider maybe even they could have a you know broken rib, slipped rib or something of that nature. So let's practice. What type mode do you suspect we have here? And if you're in a gathering of two or three people, uh, compete a little bit here. What, what, what do you think you're looking at? So take a moment to evaluate the means in which flow is delivered. Here you see it's a decelerating or progressive decay pattern. Note that pressure delivery is relatively consistent during inspiration and that volume progressively builds and almost presents identical morphology of filling during inspiration and emptying during expiration, which tells me compliance is probably pretty good. Although only four breaths are shown here, they are very consistent, almost perfect replicas of one another, hint, hint. And as denoted on the slide, on the pressure scalar, you can see each breath is patient triggered, that downward deflection. So yes, as you suspected, this is an assist control mode known in some circles as pressure control or pressure targeted assist control. Could it be pressure support mode? Well, it's highly unlikely that total cycle times, I times in particular, would be exactly consistent if it was pressure support. Also unlikely is flow would be that symmetrically repeating if we're in a pressure support mode, unless the patient's making very little effort. 
Now, a downward deflection at the beginning of a pressure scalar typically indicates a spontaneous effort or trigger. You'll also appreciate that in order to achieve relatively consistent pressures during mechanical ventilation, the flow pattern must be decelerating. And then the ventilator is going to calculate the regression or the slope of the line that is required from peak flow to end inspiratory flow in order to maintain that target pressure level. In other words, the only way in which pressure can be relatively constant is if flow decelerates, as you see here. Case in point, if you have lung tissue that is progressively filling, in other words, volume is increasing technically. And according to Boyle's law, if you remember way back when, as volume increases in a closed system, pressure drops. Well, if you want pressure to be held constant and volume is increasing, the only way to do that is flow has to continue in a positive direction, but just slows according to an algorithm the ventilator determines. Thankfully, we don't have to do that math. Aren't you happy about it? On a Friday afternoon. So what mode is likely shown here? We're getting warmed up. We'll get to the really good stuff here shortly. This is a 90 minute presentation. So I've got lots left here for you. Can you take a moment to guess? I'll let you take a pause. So this is probably SIMV mode, a synchronized intermittent mandatory mode that's pressure targeting and that has integrated pressure support applied during the window of opportunity. Now note that pressure support breaths are set to mimic the same pressure level as pressure control breaths. Now we do this in neonatal po patient populations. You don't typically do that in the adult. Also the expiratory cycle off known as expiratory sensitivity in some modes has been dialed up on the pressure support breaths to prematurely cycle. You also have something else for the super clinicians on the call that's already picked up on it. You have what looks to be around a one to one inverse ratio, maybe even a 1.5 to one. So I'm expecting higher mean airway pressures as you would uh, see here on the scalar. So what mode is shown here? Can you guess? How can you be sure? Now there is no current available mode where volume targeted breaths are integrated with pressure targeted breaths as a control mode, but we have the window of opportunity on these SIMV modes out there. We have the window of opportunity that allows the patient to breathe spontaneously on their own with just a bit of pressure support added during the window of opportunity. So what you're probably seeing here is SIMV volume control plus pressure support. And look, I make apologies on behalf of our entire profession. The proprietary nomenclature is at a new level out there. Depending on the name brand of the ventilator, depending on the manufacturer, the software integrator, there is no one on the same page out there in the market. And that's, that's my uh, sermon for the day. So just to uh, create a, a bit of additional perspective, this bar graph displays the five main common types of patient ventilator desynchrony or asynchrony over years and years of research. Most studies concur that delayed cycling is the main cause of asynchrony. In other words, the patient is not allowed to end the breath. They can't cut off inspiration without immense effort, either because the set eye time is too long or the ventilator does not recognize the patient is attempting to cycle. Now, our modern day microprocessor controlled ventilators are highly responsive with many real time biofeedback capabilities. So why are our patients still asynchronous? I know you've asked the question as have I. The simple answer is we many times are not recognizing the issue until they are in remarkable distress. Or is it that we are failing to utilize what I like to call boutique settings properly? In other words, the rise time, the cycle off percentage, the expiratory sensitivity. These are just a few proprietary examples. They're, they're considered settings that you'll rarely if ever have orders for, but they're options on your ventilator modes. I tell the students, it's sort of like going into the restaurant. You know you're hungry. You're there. They only offer certain menu items, but there are some things that you can add on, condiments, you know, a la carte items. There are certain things that will never be ordered, but you still should consider manipulating if it is an option on the ventilator. And I know that's not a, a wake-up call, but it maybe is a reality check for some out there who become complacent. And look, it's not you I'm concerned with. It's the person beside you, so don't be offended. 
So this study is now almost four decades old, but the concept has stood the test of time. Look at this date, 1985. I think we were hearing some good 1980s music when we came on the call, which I, I'll have in my head all day. Thank you for that. And I enjoy 80s music. But this study has stood the test of time. The normal long is to the far left. And then you've got a peak inspiratory pressure of 45 centimeters of water that was applied for five minutes, and then the lung is shown in the middle. They continue to apply this high PIP pressure of 45 centimeters of water for another 15 minutes, and then you've got the picture to the far right. They evaluated what's called extravascular lung water in rats. This is a rat lung, and they did pre and post tests weighing. It's just worth interjecting that we've long known that high ventilating pressures are dangerous. We now know that high tidal volumes can be detrimental and that driving pressures should be adequately managed as well. We have something else to be concerned with, not only just volume trauma and barrow trauma, but we have atelect trauma. Don't let the lungs fully collapse and then tear them back open with every successive breath. We have something called biotrauma from inflammatory mediation. All of this should be front of mind as you practice your uh, respiratory care on these precious patients. So what about patients that have extremely varying compliance from one lung to the next? For instance, here, this is, well, we'll give you a moment, take it in. What do you think you see? This is a massive left-sided pleural effusion. You're already saying, get the chest tube kit at, call Dr. So-and-so here. Is this patient destined for asynchrony, I ask you? What about giving them adequate PEEP and prolonged eye time to allow maximal recruitment and equal distribution of flow during inspiration? If only it were that simple, right? You've got to get rid of the fluid. If you've got fluid that's trapped in a closed system that's causing uh, extrinsic compression of the alveoli, it's very difficult to expand lung in that case, but just some food for thought. Here's a throwback to respiratory therapy school. It's an oldie but goodie. So if a patient is not breathing spontaneously and remains on a set respiratory rate, fairly comfortable and relatively stable, and is on volume targeting settings now, it's a good practice to do a short breath hold just to evaluate plateau pressure. Recall that plateau pressure is the pressure the lung tissue is actually experiencing overall. Peak pressure is mostly just a function of flow resistance. Whereas plateau pressure, you are taking flow out of the equation, thus the breath hold. The more, the more difference you have between PIP and plateau, the higher the airways resistance that's present. And many ventilators now have airways resistance calculating capabilities. Utilize these tools that are available to you. As respiratory therapists, we should remain students of mechanical ventilation. Specifically, if you have just one or two models of mechanical ventilators at your facility, Seek to know and understand the nuances of the machines. I want to encourage you, know every mode, just in case there comes a time when there's an open-minded ordering provider that says, you know what, what do you think? I'm not ordering the same mode I always order. Or you may have somebody that you're maxed out on settings and you have to be creative. Now, most user manuals can be readily downloaded as a PDF version online. And particularly if the ordering provider is repeatedly use, utilizing a particular mode or two over and over, become an expert at all possible settings and uses for that mode. Okay, that's just a free commercial. So what's happening here? Well, potentially you have a volume control mode with very long eye times, which induces a breath hold, and the patient is wanting more during inspiration and trying to cycle during inspiration. This is asynchrony at its worst. They're fighting the ventilator. They're trying to um, cycle expiration and at the same time they're almost double stacking a breath. So just consider, this is, uh, I should have warned you here, got a few pictures integrating just to keep you awake. This is a motor vehicle crash where a heavy piece of iron penetrated the chest wall. Now look, ventilator waveforms are not going to mean much in this patient. So back on track here, what is really occurring here? Well, if you look closely, and it, the answer really is on the screen, you have inadequate eye time, or maybe your cycle off percentage, your expiratory sensitivity is just dialed in too high. What about here? Well, you have inadequate expiratory time. Your breath triggered, your next breath triggered too early. They were still expiring. This flow here that you see 
is indicating flow was still emptying from the lung tissue on expiration when the next breath was injected. So give them a less I time, which will give them a greater E time. Remember, I and E are a seesaw relationship. When I goes up, E goes down. When I goes down, E goes up. I plus E is total cycle time. And you that work with APRV or bivin out there or by level, uh, you're already thinking, if I was on APRV, I'd need even more uh, inadequacy of E time. But we're not on bivent for this mode, although they are inversed, it seems. So what about uh, what about here? This is not something you see every day. Now, this is not a scalar you're going to see on the daily, but you may eventually encounter this scenario. So notice the gentle expiratory flow curve. It indicates that there is a low level of expiratory resistance. Uh, when I When I say the the gentle expiratory flow here. The more slope you have of a line on expiration from peak expiratory flow to full emptying, the more you may have a higher waste resistance. I mean, consider things like, does the expiratory filter need changing? Does the patient have COPD or the like? This is just volume control ventilation with an extremely long eye time, a breath hold. Now, most patients are not going to tolerate that. So we have to integrate, I mean, it's just so I can sleep tonight, a volume pressure scalar. We can't talk about graphics without showing you a compliance curve. How do I know it's a compliance curve? Compliance by definition is volume per unit pressure, and that's what you're seeing. So if each mark on the x-axis is equal to five centimeters of water, in other words, I've got five, 10, 15, 20, and so on, on this particular scalar, you've got a critical opening pressure of about 15. Critical opening pressure, known as lower inflection point, is the point at which there is a rapid increase of volume per unit pressure. You are essentially recruiting or opening the lung. And at that point, you want to set your peak two or three centimeters of water pressure above the critical opening pressure. Now, there's still the consideration of what we call the safe window. And we've known this concept for many years. There's definitely a sweet spot, so to speak, of ventilation where we avoid lung collapse at end expiration, but at the same time, we prevent overfilling or over distension of the lung during inspiration. But how do we assure this safe window? Well, for starters, conservative tidal volumes, four to seven mils per kg of predicted body weight, we, we monitor ventilating pressures, whether we're talking volume targeting mode or pressure targeting, and you've got to evaluate all the available scalars. Many ventilators now allow you to quickly evaluate a flow volume loop or even other compliance curves without any adjustment or patient stimulation. Take advantage of that. So the question is, what mode does this represent? You that use it out there, you immediately recognize the start breath, AKA the test breath, uh, depending on the model of ventilator, it could be called PRVC, it could be called Volume Control Plus, it could be called PCVG. Note the start breath and then the breaths thereafter are pressure breaths, but not patient triggered. Otherwise, it could be an SIMV mode or with no effort shown. However, because no trigger represented on the pressure graphic, most likely it's a hybrid mode where volume is targeted, but pressure is controlled or limited. Again, it would be more like your PRVC type mode. Uh, so what are your primary concerns here? If you are a seasoned clinician and you're well-versed in graphics, you immediately notice this patient has an integrated breath hold. My question is, does the patient need this much mean airway pressure? Or are they comfortable with this integrated breath hold? Maybe there's too much eye time. And for you that may be student on the call or just a refresher, that's fine. Take a close look. The way we know there's a breath hold is flow ceases, but there's no cycle. We also notice that PIP is manifested and also plateau. You only get a plateau pressure, a true plateau, in a volume mode during an inspiratory breath hold. A hundred percent of the time, you can't say this for hardly anything in life, much less respiratory care or healthcare, but a hundred percent of the time when you see a volume scalar that has a plateau, that indicates a breath hold. The only time that volume is going to remain constant is during a cessation of flow during a breath hold. Hey, that was worth the cost of admission.
So on this next one here, what do you notice? You should be familiar with some of these modes. I understand I'm, I'm dealing with clinicians across the, the country here that probably have different protocols, but you're looking here at pressure control, maybe auto mode if you're a servo user that was activated. In other words, the ventilator either automatically or you did it manually, you change to pressure support from let's say a, a control mode or an SIMV mode with a low mandatory rate. So they've got this window of opportunity here. You've got much smaller breaths across the board for breaths two through uh, four. The very first breath, obviously much larger. Uh, they all look similar. So you can only assume we probably have some uh, mandatory or assisted breaths mixed in with some supported spontaneous efforts. There's no other mode this could be. You out there on the call know if you deal with this mode, this has to be. It's known by three different uh, proprietary nomenclature terms, bivent, APRV, or bilevel. And without getting into discussion on the servo, you know, the recent software update where it's technically not APRV until we reach a certain ID ratio, uh, we're basically placing patients in this mode as a mode of max oxygenation. Most studies have shown in the last 10 years or so that we probably should put patients on this mode more often as a protective strategy if we really know uh, what we're doing. All right, let's look at some more. Are you ready? Sure, you're ready for anything. All right, for our purposes today, always begin with a quick evaluation of the flow scalar. That should be your mantra. Thereafter, look for anything out of the ordinary among the other available graphics. And so here, Note that volume never reaches baseline. Look at your volume scalar. Volume never reaches baseline here. It stays well above the x-axis. That is not normal. This indicates a possible air leak. Um, I'm thinking things like ET tube cuff at the airway itself, at the connectors, that universal 15 millimeter adapter that gets a little gummy, kind of slimy at times over the days of ventilation any filter, there may be a crack in your connector somewhere, there, the chest tube may be leaking excessively, or, or you've got some kind of displacement and the chest wall's been breached. Those are just some things to consider when you see this. Now here are three breaths that are shown among two different patients. And they're labeled, one has normal resistance and one has elevated airways resistance. So the breaths at the top exemplify normal. The breaths at the bottom are when someone has extremely high. So how can you tell? Well, look at the flow scalar and the way in which flow is emptying during expiration. There is a significant delay at the bottom three breath example. Notice here, as flow begins to empty out, it tapers, 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 almost indefinitely. So they still have some gas trapping. With normal airways resistance, flow empties and returns to baseline very quickly. So the elevated expiratory resistance is likely due to obstruction, most likely something like mild gas trapping. Um, you could end up creating a scenario of eventual hyperinflation if you don't pick up on something like this. So their x-ray goes from clear to suddenly hyperlucent, hyperinflation. Maybe they end up with a pneumothorax just from being uh, left on that ventilator mode for long periods. So here three breaths are shown for a patient initially with an inspiratory time of about 0.8 is labeled, and then it's adjusted at the bottom down to 0.4. And you say, why would I wanna put somebody on such low inspiratory times? Well, if they have significant obstruction and um, they have variable emptying, that's their issue is they can't empty out on expiration, they need extra eye time. Well, the only way to give them extra eye time is to decrease their, I'm sorry, to give them extra E time to get rid of that obstructive uh, flow is to give them less I time. So this is gas trapping initially with inappropriate inspiratory expiratory time. Uh, the bottom graphic represents a compromise if the patient can tolerate this in order to allow more prolonged emptying. Case in point here, you can see remarkable auto peep on the flow scalar. The flow was continuing to taper and empty. Here we allow a little bit more time to empty out and we almost reach baseline. They still have a little auto peep, no doubt. So shown here is an example of delayed emptying. In other words, it's known as forced expiratory flow. So during expiration, flow almost reaches baseline back to zero 
if things are as they should be. But there is a sudden additional bolus that empties in this patient's case. In other words, flow was decelerating on the expiratory side. We were emptying out. We almost reached baseline, and suddenly there is a additional dump of flow. So remember, the ventila ventilator has a sensor at the inspiratory outlet reading positive flow and a sensor at the expiratory inlet reading negative flow. So under normal circumstances, flow should always return back to zero just prior to the next trigger when inspiration will begin. If I see something like this, I know the patient is either putting forth immense effort to squeeze on expiration, or they just have a remarkable obstructive process where flow, a flow bolus, an additional flow bolus was emptied at the end of expiration. Now for this one, note that on the flow scalar at the top, uh, label A and label B, that at point A, flow suddenly changes velocity during emptying and begins a slow process of further emptying of the lung during expiration to the degree that the next breath is triggered, see point B here, uh, before flow has completely emptied. In other words, you've got emptying that appears to be rather aggressive. I would say this patient probably initially was overinflated which caused compliance to decrease, causing elastic recoil to increase significantly. But once we evacuate that initial over distension portion of air, there is a very progressive tapering. This is trademark indicating obstructive disease. Now, this is an example of severe airflow obstruction and potential mild auto peep because we still do not exactly reach baseline before the next breath is triggered. I hope this is beginning to stimulate your thought process. So this is something that you will often see, particularly in smaller patients, the neonatal pediatric population, or patients that are just irritated, agitated, poorly uh, controlled with their pain, uh, under sedated. This is called reverse triggering. Um, volume targeted breaths are machine triggered, but patient inspiratory effort is noted middle of inspiration. This can also happen with uh, hiccups or breath stacking, as it's called. So you essentially have a patient that sucks in mid-breath and breathes out with great force. So we have a divot uh, in pressure and then a large blip in pressure. Well, anytime that the patient breathes in and pressure decreases, we know because of Boyle's law, pressure is dropping. That means volume is increasing. Well, how does volume increase? Flow has to increase to fill that void. Most ventilators, if I haven't mentioned it yet, I'll mention it now, have a floating flow demand valve. It doesn't lock the patient out. Even though we limit patients and we control their breath variables, absolutely we do. If the patient happens to suddenly cough, they're going to depressurize the system. If the patient happens to suddenly take in the deepest breath they want to take in, they will be delivered what they demand to a certain degree beyond your initial setting. But wait, there's more. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, incidentally, he died of a massive heart attack from cocaine abuse, if you were curious. So this was published not long ago in uh, the journal of, I think it was Current Pediatrics. Yeah, I have it there on the screen. And uh, wasn't too long ago, January 2021. Very good reference here. I know it's quite simple. We've been doing calculus. Now we're back to just doing regular addition multiplication, but give yourself a break. It is Friday, you know. So we've got peak inspiratory pressure shown in PEEP. Immediately, I know that this is most likely a pressure mode, even though it's labeled. I didn't have to see that to know it if I understand ventilator scalars. On the right-hand side, pressure is progressively building. I'm certainly not controlling the pressure. And the only time that pressure progressively builds is if flow is continuing at high velocities, has to be a volume mode. At the bottom here, you can see the lower inflection and upper inflection points are called out. These are also known, uh, the lower one, as critical opening pressure. Uh, the point of over distension is when you start having a change in direction of this line here. This is a volume pressure scalar known as a compliance curve. When that line changes direction, over distension is present. If you can get them into that sweet spot that we looked at a moment ago, somewhere in the middle here, you will avoid premature closure on expiration and you will avoid over distension on inspiration. You know, there's nothing too wrong with the original thought process of an oscillatory way of ventilating. 
It's remarkable the first time you see it. And yes, it hasn't been FDA cleared in all patient populations. You that work more with uh, the neonate population see it uh, more than the adult population clinician. But high frequency oscillatory ventilation is simply inflating the lungs in that safe zone and using very small breaths in and out active, mind you. It's a plunger mechanism. I'm getting off on a tangent. Let's continue on. So this is another one published in that same journal, that same uh, article of January 2021. You can see effect, ineffective trigger here. The patient attempted to breathe out and then to uh, breathe in again. Now, the ineffective trigger part is really arguably could be a prolonged emptying of trapped expiratory gas as well, even though it's labeled ineffective trigger, either or. A double triggering is rarely this smooth and beautiful. This was done on a computer analog. It still uh, proves the point of what you might see in clinical practice. Just a few more from this article, then we'll go into some deeper scenarios that you might see um, on the daily. So here you can see flow starvation. How do I know that the patient wants more flow? Well, they're creating a drop in pressure. I keep going back to Boyle's law only because it is a law that holds true in every scenario when you're dealing with a closed system and you're considering pressure and volume. Remember the three variables plotted over time for mechanical ventilation, of course, are pressure, flow, and volume. Flow is administered. The ventilator is simply a flow injector through a closed system that causes volume to accumulate. Well, pressure also is created as the lungs resist stretch. There are conditions, as you see here on the screen, where the patient is dissatisfied with the amount of flow that they're receiving. And what they do is they begin to put forth effort to breathe in deeper. And when that happens, it's going to drop the pressure that you see here. That flow starvation indicates that the patient was breathing in with enough force to where flow was lagging behind their demand. And you say, I thought ventilators were microprocessor controlled, pneumatically driven, electrically powered, and servo real-time biofeedback integrated. And you'd be correct from a biomed standpoint, but patients who have a very strong stimulus to breathe for whatever reason, and they begin to take in that breath with great force, there is a lag and you will see a concavity, as you see here, indicating flow starvation. Now this is in volume mode. In a pressure mode, as you see down here to the right, what you're seeing that's just labeled as pressure rise here, that is indicating the patient is attempting to breathe out. And instead of breathing out, the ventilator has all but forced the patient to encounter that entire inspiratory time that you've set. Another reason this may happen is a sudden retching, nausea and vomiting will do this, an attempted cough, somebody's manipulating the chest wall, the patient is adjusting in the bed or being adjusted, getting a bath, and you have compressed the chest wall. Remember, the lungs and chest wall should move out together and should move in together. Now, you know, tell your kids, those are the only two that should move in together is the chest wall and the lungs. If you got teenagers like me, you have to remind them of that. So the no flow during inspiration indicates what? Think about it for a moment. You by yourself or with your small group there. What does it indicate when you see flow cease during inspiration prior to the cycle? In other words, inspiratory time is from peak flow here all the way to this point here, not back here. Inspiration continues until my cursor. In other words, the cycle doesn't happen until the breath hold ceases. For whatever reason, this patient was integrated a breath hold. Uh, it's highly unlikely if it was a spontaneous breath that a patient instinctively is going to hold their breath. So most likely we manipulated the ventilator to integrate a breath hold. Now this is good and bad. If the patient can tolerate it, it's very good for mean airway pressure. During a breath hold, what you're essentially allowing is the best equal distribution of pressure and flow that's possible during mechanical ventilation. When flow ceases, you're going to have a sharing across the board of whatever volume is available. And you say, how is it shared across the board in the lung tissue if it's a sealed system and there's no leaks? Recall your pores of cone canals of Lambert, your collateral circulatory pathways that allow equal distribution of gases. Now each lung unit has its individual compliance and resistance. But beyond our topic today would be the time constant idea, uh, maybe for another day.
I love this joke. Read it. Let it soak in just a moment. Give yourself a little brain break before we keep moving on here. I mean, you might be good, but I don't know if you're that good. Can you look and say, oh, their holy pack is full and uh, he wants to watch the Lions game just from his graphics. Let, let's not get it twisted. We don't want to overinterpret graphics, but there's a lot to be desired for uh, most of us, uh, me included, when you're dealing with all the newer technologies and the ventilators that are coming in and out, you know, they're buying uh, different vents, whatever's available, and you're, you're, you're on a learning curve, of course. I've been there. I'm still there on, uh, on a weekly basis, depending on what hospital I'm at. So when you're looking at uh, this particular drawing, it's computer generated, you've got the idealized graphics. So you're not going to see this technically as is on an actual patient or an animal specimen. Uh, this comes from a, a book by uh, Professor Chatburn called Understanding Ventilator Graphics. And I've got it listed for you down there at the bottom. It's a great read, lots of good scalars and some uh, challenging uh, cases, if you will. Um, just let some of this burn into your memory bank. Again, go to flow first every time you step to bedside. Besides putting your eyes on the patient, we should always start with the patient and work our way back to the machine. But a close second, besides looking at the vital signs as you're glancing from patient back to the machine, is look at your graphical user interface. Look at your scalars. Don't get so inundated with tunnel vision that you're concentrating just on the numbers that you fail to appreciate what is right before your eyes and start with flow. So in this case, you can argue that the flow here versus the flow here, very little difference. It makes a minuscule difference on the pressure scalar between the two. But concentrating on the volume control as labeled with constant flow versus volume control with ramp flow, instantly there is some major changes that you observe, particularly with pressure. And this is a callback to what I mentioned earlier. Even though traditional volume control modes are square flow pattern, as you see here, known as constant flow, and traditional pressure targeting or pressure control modes tend to be decelerating. We are now in a time period where technology is advanced enough to now allow us in the last five years or so on a lot of machines to now manipulate our flow scalar, where I can have a volume targeting mode, but administered with a decelerating flow pattern. So let's get to the point with this one. You see how pressure progressively builds. This is true volume control, traditional square flow pattern, and our peak pressure compared to this breath is quite higher. Volume for both look almost identical. I mean, you can't really manipulate volume that, that extreme. Volume progressively builds during inspiration and it progressively decreases during expiratory, expiratory phase. Um, by the way, on traditional conventional modes of ventilation, non-oscillator ventilation, um, inspiration is active and expiration is always passive. So depending upon the lung compliance and therefore elastic recoil, your expiratory side of your scalars are dependent on how the lung empties, which will dictate the visual that you get. Back on track here though, what we definitely notice is the way that flow determines pressure during inspiration in particular. Pressure can go from full pressurized system to zero instantly on both. Volume is progressive build, progressive empty on both. Flow, depending on the pattern, can be peak flow constant or peak flow then rapid deceleration. But you can tell the more gentle flow delivery would, of course, be the decelerating flow ramp. Screen froze a moment. There we go. This is from that same book. Again, concentrate on green in this case would be the inspiratory phase known as inspiratory time. And that transition to red would be where the cycle occurs. And then your red tracing would be all expiration. So in this case, just the sheer visual here, you can see inspiratory time and expiratory time look very similar. I would say close to one-to-one -one ratio visually here. But keep in mind, as mentioned earlier, true full expiratory time is accounted for on mechanical ventilation by also including the pause. So from cycle to trigger is expiratory time. From trigger to cycle is inspiratory time. So from that same text, on the left uh, here, you've got uh, work shifting in volume control as it's known. So the left is, is passive. You've got, um, 
you got no work shifting. The middle is uh, moderate and the right is severe. In other words, divide the breaths up into breath one, breath two, breath three. We're talking patient effort known as work shifting. And so on the far left, there's really no work shifting. It's very smooth. Uh, the ventilator delivers the flow that it was set to deliver. Pressure progressively builds. It's quite smooth and beautiful. And then the middle, you start getting some work shifting. In other words, the patient is beginning to interact with the mechanical ventilation. And by the time you get to the right-hand side, you see that dramatic drop in pressure. It's not quite as beautiful. Now, flow is constant unless the patient demands a significant more uh, amount of flow. And in this case, they didn't contribute that effort enough to open the floating flow demand valve. And therefore, in volume mode, you're telling the machine, give exactly this amount of flow over this amount of time. And pressure is the variable that is going to be dynamic. So on the right-hand side here, right bottom, you've got what's considered work shifting in pressure control. So on the left, very little, uh, these are three breaths, three different breaths, by the way, of course. Um, on the left here, you have a flow that's decelerating, each one is, but near the second breath, you have the patient is triggering the breath. That's what the white indicates. I don't know if you can appreciate it. You also have a downward deflection, so that indicates the patient is triggering the breath. Not only are they triggering the breath, but they're putting forth a little more effort. Now, it's a weak effort, but they're effort enough to produce a concavity of your pressure scalar. If you do not see a blip in flow, it was a very weak effort, but they are becoming asynchronous nonetheless. So in the middle, moderate work shifting, and by the time we get to breath three here, not only is the patient triggering each breath, but they are now um, showing you that they are flow starved. When you see this downward divot, this concavity on the pressure scalar, they are starving for flow. Give them more flow. They're going to be asynchronous, very uncomfortable. And just a clinical nugget, if your patient is writhing in the bed and they're not having a bowel movement or there is not something under them causing discomfort or pain, they are demonstrating in their own way the intubated form of dyspnea. Once you get to the ventilator, you, of course, will look at the scalar and know exactly what they're doing. Also look for a slight change in their countenance. They may be grimacing furrowing their brow. Again, if they're not having a bowel movement, they're not in pain from something stuck underneath them or, you know, a, a new catheter or something, most likely they're in respiratory distress. They could be. So here is an example of a patient that is actively expiring during a pressure support breath. So remember, pressure support breaths, most spontaneous breaths on mechanical ventilation are what's known as terminal flow cycled. In this case, the patient is actively expiring. So at the very end of inspiration, if you recall, a pressure supported breath is a pressure targeted breath. You should see a relatively plateaued pressure scalar. So with that said, when you see a blip of pressure at the end, the patient is forcing the breath. Now you could either change your cycle off percentage, that's a boutique setting, it's also known as termination sensitivity on some ventilators. Um, you cannot set or adjust eye time in pressure support mode. So if you're thinking eye time, it's just not allowed. It's not an option in pressure support mode. Just food for thought. We have a few more as we start winding down a bit. So this is an example. Take a moment, see if you can troubleshoot in your own mind and figure out what's going on. So you're seeing this repeatedly, it's 3 a.m., you took an extra shift on your day off. Okay, they're giving you emergency pay. I get it. I would have done it too, I guess. They needed you. But you're in the ICU. You're in an unfamiliar territory. You're in surgical. You usually work medical, but you're in the ICU. Finally, the nurses have figured out that you definitely can be trusted. You know what you're doing, and you're taking good care of this patient. But you step to the bedside, and this is what you see. This patient is demonstrating, by the book, cycling asynchrony. The patient's inspiratory time is longer than the positive pressure set inspiratory time. They're actually wanting to breathe in longer. And in this case, the ventilator cut them off and they went ahead and triggered immediately and the ventilator responded. So the patient is essentially attempting to continue to breathe in, creating a sudden reopening of the inspiratory valve. 
Well, flow rushes in according to demand, causing a small spike in pressure after the initial breath has ended. Now, it's still a weak effort nonetheless, but you had your flow sensitivity set properly to where they could be recognized and they could trigger. Take a moment. We're nearing the end. Soak it in. See what you think. You're faced with this probably more common than you realize. You know, when you buy a new car, you start noticing all the cars similar to yours on the road. I hope after today you start noticing some of these scalars that maybe you haven't before, that you've been seeing for weeks or months on your patients. This is another example of what's known as cycling asynchrony. The patient's inspiratory time that was set is shorter than the positive pressure set inspiratory time. They're trying to forcefully expire. The patient is attempting to breathe out as flow continues moving in. Essentially, the patient is attempting to cycle from I to E, from inspiration to expiration, but has to put forth immense effort. And that's what causes that sudden spike in pressure at the end of inspiration. So we've all seen this. Now, you, some of you on the call are already shouting out exactly what it is. You're already stepping to bedside. You're ready to correct. But maybe thinking outside the box, what all could it be here? So this tracing uh, corresponding to a, a patient with pressure support ventilation is what you're looking at here. So this is somebody in pressure support mode. A few notable things is your decelerating flow. You've got a pressure scalar that isn't square. Uh, it's slightly increasing, but what I'm really noticing is the oscillatory waveforms on both the expiratory limb or the expiratory side of flow and the expiratory uh, portion of your pressure scalar. And I also notice on occasion, volume is not reaching baseline. So is it really a leak or do we have some asynchrony issue here? Well, what you're seeing is oscillations, characteristics mostly of secretions in the airway. Now, it could be water in the circuit. It could be an HME that's overfilled with condensation. I mean, these are just examples of what possibly you could be dealing with here. So the patient probably needs suctioning. Now, one of the easiest ways to tell if it's truly secretions in the airway, I'll give you two ways to tell it non-invasively. You're not going to upset the fruit basket. You're not going to set off any alarms and it doesn't require any equipment. We all love those scenarios. You step to the bedside, you take your index finger and your thumb and you just compress the ET tube very gently, if you feel vibrations, they probably have secretions in their airway. Or you take your flat hand or the heel of your hand or the back of your hand, please wear gloves, and place it on the patient's chest wall. If you feel vibrations, known as tactile freminus, they probably need suctioning unless they can clear it with the cough. But these are just examples. One of the best resources that you can get your hands on if you just want to take a deep dive. Now, I'm not recommending this for just the weekend warrior or the RT who just needs an occasional refresher. I'm talking about somebody who's passionate about waveforms. You're a department head, you're a director, maybe you're a physician on the call, or, or somebody who just wants to, to beef, up, beef up their knowledge. This was just released uh, this year, copyright 2023. And I got to talk to Dr. Waugh at the conference not long ago. Very approachable, very nice individual. It's a great investment for anyone who's pursuing a, a better understanding. This will be a great resource. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it used to be unheard of. This uh, book was not available because it was out of print. And so they just released it and it kind of makes me excited if you can't tell. 